Welcome to Slash Forward. How could we have possibly gotten here from where we started? Answering that involves following the world's most elite expedition crew into some of the deepest, darkest recesses of the Earth. What fresh horrors await us in this virgin frontier? The answer is startling and probably nothing that you'd expect, so let's get to it. We open in Romania during the Cold War era or approximately 30 years ago, depending on the time in which you exist, and follow a truck as it winds through a narrow mountain pass. It eventually arrives at their destination and breaks into a prohibited area, which titillates its passengers. They're engaged in some sort of mountaintop heist of an old, crusty church. So they swing in, give big ups to Jesus real quick, and then descend into the ossuary. This leads them to the carving room, where the monks pass their time whittling the walls. But they're not here looking for decor, they're looking for a man-sized hole. After finding the approximate location, they blow it open. This compromises the structural integrity of the floor, resulting in them becoming more in the cave than they had anticipated, and subsequently, a bit more under the mountain as well. In the cavern, they hear that classic monster chirping noise that has become so popular in recent years. 30 years later, we find another group of radical hole enthusiasts popping open a freshie, which happens to be the location we just finished visiting. Inside is running water and tons of cool cave stuff. However, the potential depth and breadth of this cavernous system requires experienced and reckless divers. That leads us to Mexico, where an elite team of cave divers are diving a cave. Their specialty is squeezing into tiny holes, exploring dark places, and finding exactly what they came for, even if it means stretching the rules and best safety practices. That night, Nikolai Skypes them to confirm he's managed to both find the cave he was looking for and acquire funding, so now he requires their expertise. They live for this stuff, so they agree to redirect to Romania immediately. Before you know it, they're swooping in like ballers on a private helicopter. Once on ground, a quick check confirms their equipment is looking good, as are Tyler's prospects in the ladies' department. Dimples doesn't waste any time and runs right up to introduce himself to Dr. Jennings and her cameraman, Alex. He pulls his best move trying to impress her with the advanced modifications they've done to their rebreathers, which allows him to go down for up to 24 hours, due to a triple redundancy that they built in. Now that is some sexy tech talk. But then Big Brother Jack strolls in to throw some orders around, take control of the situation, and let everyone know who's got the big balls around here. They gather that night in the mess hall for a briefing from Jack. They're going under for 12 days with the intent of finding a nice dry cavern where samples can be collected. They're fairly well jazzed about it. But then even later, we get some backstory on why it had been sealed off in the first place. Local legend indicates the presence of demons. The next morning, these thrill seekers immediately dive in to soak up some wicked slackline action. They set up their first outpost at the bottom and send Briggs in to scout out the initial length of cave. He glides along and keeps them informed until his signal goes out. From that point, he's left to do his mapping in silence while the others sit around and kill time. Right when the worry sets in, Briggs comes back online, loud and clear from their future base camp 2.4 miles in. I haven't seen a hole like this in a long time. Well, that was crass. While they're talking, he finds a huge naked mole rat, which he shows off proudly. He's then distracted by something else something in the darkness, and then the signal is lost. They all suit up and begin their journey through the long tunnel, stopping to snap some pics of some sick cave drapes along the way, and are soon at base camp. When they arrive, Briggs is all good, and he's found evidence of prior discovery. Meanwhile, while fixing the fiber optic cable, Strode sees one of those mole rats and goes to investigate. But when he pops out of the water, the fleshy little meat wad has been eviscerated. The likely presence of an apex predator dawns on him, right as Tyler notes the cable appears to have been chewed up. Then Strode gets a little chewed up, and in the struggle, his submersible is detonated, blasting Tyler to the surface and causing a cave-in. They follow the dive wire back and start to excavate what they can, but it causes an underwater avalanche, preventing them from being able to continue safely. The final assessment? They can't get out the way they came, and no one is expecting them back for 12 days. By the time they're reached, their supplies will be long gone, but Jack's rational planning is interrupted abruptly by Briggs's emotional outburst regarding the mounting evidence that there's something down there with them looking to feast on their tender man meat. All well and good, but Jack's final word is that since the best team to rescue them happens to be them, they shall rescue themselves. So they continue on, scouting ahead and finding additional evidence that they're not yet in virgin territory. During a break, Jennings shows Nikolai a sample of a parasite she found, 
which she also had found on a salamander. While elsewhere, the scouting continues. Jack finds a tight hole and makes like he's going back inside his mama. But completely unlike being born in reverse, he actually finds himself confronted by an army of scorpions. Before he can ward them off, he gets ripped up by a much larger creature that Top never sees. When they return, he has a giant claw wound on his shoulder blade. And one of the claws he managed to take is a trophy. But he also never got a good look at what the thing was. Upon examination, they find it to be highly reflexive and also riddled with parasites. Jennings notes that this appears to be the first creature they found that did not evolve for deep cave life after originating on the surface. Given all this excitement, Nikolai suggests they wait for help to come, but Jack insists they keep it moving. They travel along, finding bones and squeeze into crevices, all the while pursued by the unnerving sound of echolocation. As Jack leads and decides with assuredness, there's some growing resentment from Briggs, who feels the sonar gun is the best tool for path picking. When they get to the climbing part, Charlie leads the way, setting up the safety line for him. They eventually reach water again. Here, Jack becomes excessively moody, lashing out and negating the sole reason Alex is even there. At the next open area, Jack calls for a quick 20. When he pops a squat, we learn that he's developing superhuman hearing and is able to eavesdrop on multiple conversations about his fitness as a leader. In response to this, he calls Tyler over to enlist his help in rebuilding trust with the group. They begin to drop into the water as they are echolocated from above. After a short pass, they pop out where the current has created an underwater river rapid. According to Jack, that's the only way out, so they take turns sliding down the rocks and hoping to avoid any major head contusions. Tyler intends to escort Jennings. but. Something pulls her away while the current sucks Tyler in. He goes ripping by Nikolai, who's sitting on a rock with his shin sticking out, and then gets ejected from a 40-foot finale that ensures there's no going back. But Jennings does eventually get pooped out, so they're just down the one guy. Charlie pops up and claims there's something in the water, which seems to be a school of shrieking eels. After lighting up, they traverse the expanse, but as soon as they group up, Nikolai finally dribbles out. Jack goes back to get him, but he's being hunted. So he arrives to nothing but a bloody cloud. He still goes under to take a look, and he emerges just in time to see Nikolai get sucked into a crack. He returns to a now very somber group, and they continue on, hoping to find solid ground. They eventually find what they need and then begin scouting ahead again. Jack now insists on scaling the wall while Jennings points out that this is the main water flow, so they should be able to follow it straight out of here. But Jack insists that that's a trap, and the wall's where you're going to want to go if you hope to survive. As the two brothers prepare to climb, they are provided with a couple of propane blasters rigged up for protection. Before they can get going, however, Charlie is already scaling the wall, trying to prove her worth. She very quickly moves up and out of sight, and when she gets over the edge, she feels a draft. She calls it out so they know to follow her up, but then she is confronted by a beast, causing her to let out a little wail. Aw, she's scared. Her retreat is too sudden, causing her to lose her footing and plunge 50 feet. She recovers fairly quickly and, since it's unlikely she'll be able to get to the bottom fast enough, begins wall running. Once she builds up a head of steam, she, in one motion, hits that moist bitch with some fire and then cuts herself free, catapulting to the other side and sticking the landing. Unfortunately, the beast flies, and it jacks her up good before she flames it, sending it to the center of the earth. The movie then yada yada is getting her down. As they mourn, they also notice something strange as regards Jack's eyeballs. Jennings comes to the realization that the parasite isn't work here, converting its host into a new cave-dwelling creature. This means that Jack may be able to look forward to the gift of flight. Despite his obvious affliction, there is still some argument about which direction they should take with Jennings, Briggs, and Alex forging off on their own. Jack leads his crew deeper and deeper, which seems counterintuitive. But when Top goes toppling down even further, the impact of the debris actually breaks open an ice hole that empties out into a secret methane chamber. Here, they find scenes that are reminiscent of the church mosaic, making them believe that there is likely an entry point somewhere nearby. They do run across a cold water spring, which indicates a pathway out. But their celebration is undermined when Jack starts going through monster puberty. Since he has to deal with that, and Top has a leg injury from his fall, Tyler goes back to find the others and lead them to safety. He rushes through the water, trying to get back as quickly as possible, and arrives upon the shore to find the wreckage of their belongings, and Briggs being sucked into the customary feed hole. Tyler slithers in after him, but finds that Briggs lives in the ceiling now, and his new daddy doesn't appreciate being interrupted at dinner time. He's chased a short distance, but then the monsters retreat, which he finds to be the effect of the sonar gun. He guides them back, and with one underwater stretch between them and Salvation, they go in raw. 
Jennings does not make it out conscious, so Tyler rips her top open for maximum airflow to the chesticles, which always does the trick. They then make their way along until they arrive in the cozy, warm bosom of the methane tomb. When they all meet up, Jack notes that their attackers all seem to be waiting on something, and that the second rebreather is resting on a nearby ledge. He makes an attempt to retrieve it as the others head for the water. All this movement agitates the hungry predators, requiring the survivors to drop a couple of pulses to drive them off. Along the way, Alex becomes a victim of geology, taking a few stalactites to the upper torso before being consumed. The others slip below the surface of the water, engaging in combat and managing to take out one of the brood. Then Jack does some action stuff to gain a strategic advantage, I'm sure, and covers their retreat. But of course, their successful retreat then also reveals that they didn't need the second rebreather after all. Poor Jack. Back in Greater Romania, the crew splits up, agreeing to meet back at this cafe in one year's time. But before she goes, Jenning does a cheeky little reveal that she's now a carrier of the cave parasite. Tyler makes a commendable attempt to stop her, but when he's unsuccessful, he lets it go. Oh, cave. Cave, 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 cave. What are we going to do with you? This was a good movie with a strong concept, although it was done better in The Descent. There's just something about it that didn't fully bring the movie together for me. It was dragged down with the unnecessary injection of various tropes and cliches, which I'm gonna blame on studio interference, because it seemed like the kind of stuff some idiot executive would think are necessary pieces of the formula for success. Like the time spent talking about their special technology, and how they had rigged it up and what it would allow them to do. None of which actually was relevant anywhere else in the movie either in terms of needing the equipment at its full capacity, or something going wrong that needed to be fixed, or anything else for that matter. It was totally unnecessary to make these diving experts also technology wizards. In spite all of the intergroup tension they set up, nothing ever really came to fruition. There was no major falling out or conflict that had to be resolved at any point. Jack's transformation never gave him any major moment of pause, and he ended up being helpful all the way to the end. It just felt like these were things that were being added unnecessarily, either by preference of someone with influence, or due to budgetary constraints on their monster effects. Because really, that was the major problem these elements introduced. They focused the story almost entirely on the group, but with no major major conflicts or resolutions. This, along with taking the focus off the threat of the monsters, drained the film of any tension. And that's really too bad, because the movie was good. It had great effects and a really talented cast. I'm just not sure why, if given the choice, you would ever watch this one over The Descent, which came out the same year. Now that we're here, I want to congratulate you for making it to the end of the video, and affirm that you are a very special person because of it. Before we go, I'd like to give a huge thanks to my donors, memorializing the Hall of Headshots. I have a website set up where you can support the channel through donations or merch. Any donation unlocks a growing collection of uncensored movie recaps. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become a part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.